Good afternoon. I would like to call the meeting of the Assembly Committee on Revenue to order. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Gallant. Present. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblyman Ort Licker. Yeah. Assemblywoman Summer Armstrong. Present. Chair Bacchus. Present. Thank you so much. We have all 12 members present today. Um, thank you. I'd like to welcome our audience members here in Carson City, as well as those in Las Vegas and anyone that may be appearing by telephone this evening. Um, tonight, um, before we get started, a couple things. Um, please make sure your electronic devices are muted. And another thing, whenever you're answering any questions, please feel free to go directly to one of the committee members. You don't have to go through the chair. Um, hopefully that will expedite um, tonight's hearings. We do have a presentation by the Attorney General's office this evening on um, various structured settlements. Um, and we will be taking our bills out of order this evening. We will be hearing AB 53 before we hear AB1. So with that this evening, I would ask um, the representatives from the Attorney General's office um, to come up and um, do your presentation and please feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Teresa Benitez Thompson, for the record, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford. I wanna extend Attorney General Ford's regrets for not being here. He had planned to be here, but he's presently in virtual court. Um, and our, our um, Mark uh, just ran over as well, uh, hopping off a of virtual court. So you're gonna see him give his uh, presentation on opioids and then run back to the hearing. Um, so that being said, uh, first of all, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for having the Attorney General's office here, and thank you for the opportunity to introduce you to the good work that the Attorney General's office does. The office consists of nearly 350 dedicated, hardworking individuals committed to enforcing Nevada law and upholding justice for the protection and benefit of our citizens. I want to give you a quick overview of the office before we delve into the presentations on opioid settlement funding and tobacco master settlement agreement. So A.G. Ford really believes that his job is to ensure justice for all Nevadans. And he directs all employees within the office to approach the work in the same vein. He has a motto, our job is justice. At any time, if you walk into the office with any employee and you say, what's our job? They're gonna look at you and say, our job is justice. To support the office's mission of justice, he's adopted five C's. Constitutional rights, criminal justice and reform, consumer protection, client services, and community engagement. And each one of these five C's serves as a moral compass to guide the ways in which the Office of Attorney General can serve Nevadans. So, Attorney General Ford is the state's chief law enforcement officer, and he represents the people of Nevada. He represents the people's best interest before state and federal trial, appellate court, and criminal and civil matters. He also serves as, uh, the office also serves as legal counsel to state officers, state departments, most state boards and commissions. Additionally, the office works with local, state, and federal law enforcement uh, partners to protect the public. We invite you all to read our 2020, 2020 to 2022 biennial report, which can be found at our website, which is ag.nv.gov. We would have printed it, but it is a pretty substantial report, and in, uh, multiply that by 25 as copies for the public, and uh, we it, it gets to be pretty hefty and hard to carry over in snowstorms, but it is a public document, and you can find it easily at our website. But knowing you're busy people, we just want to highlight some of the accomplishments from the office. So first, we aggressively defended tort claims, saving the state more than $1.3 billion, billion in taxpayer dollars. We processed 18,454 constituent complaints and 39,069 constituent inquiries for information and services. 
we prosecuted elder abuse and pro provided support to enforcement agencies across the state to do the same and attended more than 500 guardianship hearings for elder and vulnerable Nevadans. And what we'll be talking a little bit more about today obtained $330 million in funding to combat the opioid epidemic. So at the request of Chair Bacchus, the Assembly Revenue Committee will be receiving two presentations relevant to this committee's jurisdiction. First, a presentation on opioid settlement dollars inclusive of the allocation of recovered dollars through the One Nevada Agreement, of which you all have a copy of. Um, we're extremely proud of the meaningful recoveries that have been made through this office and, and still continue in a lot of that work. Second, you'll learn about the Tobacco Master Settlement, which was the largest civil litigation settlement in the United States when it was signed in 1998. The funds flowing into Nevada from this settlement are vitally important to the Millennium Scholarship and to the Fund for a Healthy Nevada. Lastly, the committee is going to hear a presentation on Assembly Bill 53, which is seeking to create a better balance in the enforcement of Nevada's underage youth smoking laws. The state will be better off for it, for sure, with the enactment of Assembly Bill 53, but just want to acknowledge at the outset that we have many well-intended stakeholders who are still coming to agreement on the final version of this language. With that being said, I'm going to allow uh, Mark to begin. Thank you, Teresa. My name is Mark Kruger. I'm a Chief Deputy Attorney General with the Attorney General's Office Bureau of Consumer Protection. I'm pleased to be here. Good evening. Um, we I have a short presentation for you all, and I can certainly take questions during the presentation or at the end, whatever your, your pleasure. Um, you can go ahead and turn. So as an opioids litigation update, um, the state of Nevada, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, our, our, has purposes to, uh, of the litigation is to seek to hold accountable those individuals, the named defendants, for their contributions to creating the opioids epidemic here in Nevada. Um, as we all know, the epidemic has, is a national one, and uh, Nevada has been one of the hardest hit states, unfortunately. Uh, the lawsuit was filed um, by amended complaint on June 27th, uh, 2019 in the 8th Judicial District Court. Um, as uh, Teresa just mentioned, we have uh, ongoing hearings. However, it's important to note that the discovery phase of the trial or the litigation is closed, and we have a trial date of May 1st, 2023, so this year. Um, we are going to go to a jury trial, uh, so it will take a, quite a bit of time to get through that. Um, anticipated to be several months to, to get through that trial. It should be noted that some of the litigation is currently uh, stayed by federal bankruptcy courts, in particular Purdue Pharma, as well as the individuals who own that company, the Sacklers. Uh, there was also a recovery uh, through a, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later, through a bankruptcy court. It was Malincrot. So um, I did include a link to our website where you can find the documents that are relevant to the case, uh, including the One Nevada Agreement, which I'm going to talk about here in a few minutes, um, as well as the complaint itself, which is, is voluminous. So... Where do the recoveries go? Well, the the important thing was first getting into getting recoveries. And in order to do that, we uh, got together in, in very Nevada fashion. Uh, we came together with our counties and our litigating cities, and we were able to create a document that we uh, refer to as the One Nevada Agreement. What it is in actual title is the One Nevada Agreement on Allocation of Opioid Recoveries. What this document did was allow us to be able to negotiate on behalf of all the signatories to the agreement in order to get recoveries uh, and settlements. We maximize the amount of recoveries by having all of our litigating subdivisions in a settlement. So it's a, it's a very good document. Uh, we put some protections in place to ensure that the recoveries 
uh, go to abatement because if we don't abate this epidemic, it isn't going to go away and we're just going to be right back where we are um, with, with hundreds and thousands of people dying um, and other overdoses. So the mechanism itself actually is a way to share costs. Uh, costs of these litigations can be expensive, and by sharing them with, among all of us, uh, it, it reduces the amount of cost. And it also is a way for us to um, require that the local governments who received part of the share of this uh, have a annual reporting requirement on what the use is so we can ensure that the use is being done to abate the epidemic uh, consistent with the uh, most of the agreements as well as uh, recent legislation passed last session which requires use of this money the state's portion to be used for abatement go ahead so the legislation that was created also created a fund called the Fund for Resilient, a Resilient Nevada. Fund for Resilient Nevada is a uh, fund that does not revert to the general fund, but requires that the Department of Health and Human Services use the recoveries from any litigation uh, related to opioids that the state's portion be deposited into this fund and used for abatement. Um, the, it also contains, uh, the legislation also contains a reporting requirement to the, the legislature uh, every year as well on the use of the money. Department of Health and Human Services is responsible for the use of the money, and um, I, I won't delve into to what they've done other than they have created what we call a state plan, which is based upon a needs assessment they created on how they're going to fund priority services and programs to actually accomplish the abatement. So this is just another way of uh, explaining everything that I just talked about. I, some people are visual and like charts, so I decided I would include a chart in case you, you want to follow how the, the process goes. Okay, the next chart is a chart that I have compiled, which is it represents the actual and estimated settlement dollars that will be coming in. These are all settlements that have been entered into um, by, by the state of Nevada and the signatories to the One Nevada Agreement. And you will see uh, all of the, I tried to be as, as transparent as possible to show the money coming in and then the cost and the fees and then the net amounts to be distributed. So unfortunately, it's a little bit small on these screens <laughs> because it's fortunately has a lot of lines. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, but the bottom line numbers are a little bit bigger. And as you can see, the gross amount that we have gotten to date um, or will be getting because some of these are paid over time is uh, $320,768,972.54. There are some uh, costs that have been taken off of that, as well as some uh, f fees, and then the total allocation after fees is still $265,717,333.92. As you can see, um, the bulk of those uh, have or will be paid through 2023, and then there will be several payments uh, through the distributor's payment, which are coming in through July of 2038. The next chart that we created was uh, important because it breaks down the actual dollars amounts that are being deposited into the resilient fund. And if you want to go to the next slide, the chart itself uh, represents the one recovery that we had that was pre the One Nevada Agreement. That's the first one. Um, and then all other portions of the recoveries that go to the state of Nevada for a total of uh, $165,467,858.51. I, I failed to bring my readers, so I apologize when I'm doing this. So, um, but anyway, the net recoveries are $136,700,214.70. Uh, the one thing I do want to note about both of these charts is three things. One is that, that they assume that there's no defaults in these payments. 
uh, and we don't anticipate that there will be. It also uh, assumes that it, it does, does not deduct any uh, CMS Medicaid match costs that might need to be deducted. So far, we haven't had any. And the third point is that it assumes no administrative fees for court-appointed administrators. Uh, Third-party administrators have been removed. We are hopeful, and to date, the third-party administrator fees have been paid off of the interest um, before the actual uh, allocations, and we're hopeful that will continue and there won't be any additional deductions, and we will see the numbers that are represented in these two charts uh, coming in uh, exactly as anticipated. And with that, if you have any questions, I promised I would keep it brief, and I did. Thank you, Mr. Kruger, because I understand you probably need to get back to um, the court matter. I'm going to break this up, and I hope um, the chief of staff doesn't mind me doing that. But um, we do have some questions for you regarding it, um, the settlement. Um, I'll start with um, Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the work that you're doing on this. Um, it's very important for us to do this work. Uh, my first question actually has to do with the, I believe that there is from the National Association of Attorney Generals. There's also been work being done at the federal level or as a coalition. Are we involved in that coalition at all or is this court case only for Nevada and working separately or are we using that court case as kind of a way to help us in some of our arguments? Thank you, through, through your Madam Chair to Assemblywoman Anderson. The, the case that we're talking about, the state's litigation, um, and the corresponding One Nevada Agreement, which has uh, individual litigation by the different counties and litigating cities, that case, the state's case, is a state-only case and, and not involved at a national level. When you refer to the national level, uh, there is a multi-district litigation that has been ongoing where there's probably some 3,000 different cases throughout the country that have been transferred to that, that particular federal court. And those that, MD, we call them MDLs, the MDL uh, litigations are in generally a stayed status uh, unless they have a bellwether case go forward. And we're not involved in that uh, at all. Thank you, Chair. And I, I'm not sure if, how far this should go with, with the questioning because of the case coming up. Um, but just to, well, I'll just ask anyways. I know that there was another case that was just recently um, uh, ended. I believe it was the Jewel case where we now have also um, the distribution, or excuse me, the storage of those e-cigarettes or those vaping machine, those vaping items. Is there been a discussion about us also as a state having to do something with um, holding on these op opioids and or destroying them on our own? Again, though, I don't want to overstep the legal questions as you're preparing for this, cape, this case, so I don't know if that is something that can be answered or not. Sorry, Mark Kruger again for the record. Uh, thank you uh, through you, Chair, to Assemblywoman Anderson. So uh, talking about two different things, one, the opioids litigation is a state litigation. As part of the state's work to abate the epidemic, they have done different things such as uh, several years ago installed some incinerators so that they can help destroy uh, the take back drugs programs or anybody who has opioids in their home who wants to bring them to a sheriff's office can deliver them safely and have them uh, safely destroyed and, and uh, that that's one piece of it when we talk about the jewel multi-state the jewel multi-state was uh, several states who got together and uh, were looking at jewel labs for deceptive trade practices, uh, specifically advertising, uh, deceptive advertising conduct. And nonetheless, that, that was settled independently, of course, of the opioids litigation. And that particular matter um, is not related at all to opioids, and, and the, the funding goes a different route than the funding. The, it goes a statutory route. This funding goes a different statutory route, <laughs> so the opioids funding. I hope that answers your question. It does because, and I knew that they were two different things. It has more to do with the storage and the destroying of the products that I was really trying to get to. Uh, but you answered that with the other work that, that the state has done in the past few years with what we've been able to, to gather those items. So thank you, and thank you, Chair. 
Um, before we go on to our next question, I just had a quick um, clarification that I was curious about with um, the first chart that had the um, settlements post the One Nevada Agreement. Um, I saw that the total allocation after the fees that would have been distributed pursuant to the One Nevada is that $265 million. So is that because it looks like it's inclusive of all of the counties and cities. And so of that portion, the state would get then pursuant to the One Nevada agreement, the 43.86% of that total, or is that the total that's going to the state? Mark Kruger, for the record, thank you, Chair, for your question. You actually reminded me that I should have mentioned something else about the One Nevada agreement. In order to get the maximum amount under some of these settlements, you had to have uh, the majority, um, if not all, of your um, specific counties um, and sub, you know, basically local governments that have specific populations included in these settlements. We, as I said, in typical Nevada fashion, came together and did so. I'm just really proud of all of our signatories to the One Nevada Agreement because we did come together and we included all counties, whether or not they were litigating or non-litigating, so that they all are receiving something. Because frankly, this opioids epidemic does not care about county lines or city lines. It just kills. So when we did that, we also included all litigating subdivisions uh, that were litigating within this state. Uh, that way, everything, all of our state as a whole through the One Nevada Agreement was covered. So. When we talk about the recoveries at, uh, in chart one, we're talking about all recoveries that go to all, all of the signatories to the one about agreement, as I explained. In chart two is the amount that you, that is actually allocated uh, to the state. And if you go to the one about agreement, you'll see in here the 43.86%, you are correct. That amount comes out of this chart one and is reflected in chart two. I hope that answers uh, well, your question. <laughs> it now raises another question for okay. me, actually. Um, then if it goes into chart two, are we then paying fees again on the the state's portion of recovery? Because that's what it's looking like to me when I'm looking at chart two. Sorry about that. Mark Kruger, for the record. Thank you, Chair. No, no. Let me clarify that. So chart two summarized into chart one. So it's a little backwards, I apologize for that. But um, so that this is a total of fees that would have been paid out by any particular signatory to the agreement. So remember the fees sometimes are a little bit different rates. So that totals all the fees that would be paid out. The, the fees that are reflected in chart two are inclusive of the fees in chart one. So it's, it's not separate and above. Thank you for that. And we'll go to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and I'm sorry I had to step out for a moment, so, I'm, so I hope I didn't miss this part. Um, but I just have a question, and you touched on the drug take-back programs. I just want to make sure, um, and I see on slide four it says that, that the Fund for Resilient Nevada requires the funds to be used to abate the opioid epidemic through evidence-based programs and services, so that does allow for funds to, to go for drug take-back programs, correct? Mark Kruger, for the record, through you, Chair, to Assembly Lauren Cohen. The list of take-back programs that is actually in the Nevada State Plan, which was created by the Department of Health and Human Services. It is extensive. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that that is a program and service that is included in that list. If you go to the Department of Health and Human Services website, you can find the uh, state plan and needs assessment, or later I can go ahead and, and forward it to, to this committee if, if that makes it easier. Um, it's very accessible online, and it's very inclusive. They did a fantastic job putting it together. Okay, thank you. Do we have any further questions for Mr. Kruger? Oh yeah, As Assemblyman O'Neill, no please. Thank you. Going back to the uh, chart one, the $46 million in attorney fees, those are, you used house counsel, correct? You didn't go outside? Uh, Mark Kruger, for the record, uh, through you, Chair, to Assemblyman O'Neill. The, the 
fees that are represented, so here there's costs that come off first, and then there's fees. The state did engage outside contingency fee council pursuant to NRS 228.111. I believe that Teresa said she mentioned that she had uh, provided you all a copy of that contingency fee contract. I may not have looked at it. When I was yesterday, I heard how the attorney general's office is the largest law firm in the state of Nevada. They handle all kinds of cases, intricate cases, important cases, Supreme Court cases, district court cases. Can you explain why they aren't able to handle these cases? Well, why I, we had to go out $46 million to outside counsel? Mark Kruger, for the record, uh, I can let you know that the governor and the attorney general, pursuant to NRS 228-11 and following statutes, entered into a declaration that declared a need to have assistance of outside counsel because of the complexity of the case and the issues. That statutory process was followed, and pursuant to that statutory process, we engaged outside counsel on this particular thing. As an example, just an example in this case, we had at one time over 70 attorneys reviewing documents. So you can see by that sheer volume of document review, the need to engage outside counsel, we simply don't have in the AG's office 70 extra attorneys that aren't already working on important matters as you've identified. So yes, there, there absolutely was a need. Any further questions? Thank you so much, Mr. Kruger. I know you need to get back, and so um, we'll close um, on this settlement, and we'll move over to the discussion of the tobacco settlement. Thank you so much. Thank and you. A real quick, Chair Buckus, just so you know, we did provide, um, the, we we usually get asked about that fee piece, and, and uh, AG Ford in the office is absolutely transparent in those, and so we did provide contingency um, our contingency report, which is provided annually to the, the legislature. It's a public document. Um, we provided it in advance that we'd have questions on it. So the committee staff will be sure to, to get it to you and then it'll be posted as an exhibit as well. I, I do believe I actually saw it come in and I could help the committee. Um, it did come in, I believe from Mr. Christie. I do believe, I thought I saw it and I, if I'm wrong, um, I know I've seen it at some time. We did get a, quite a few exhibits from your office um, at 9, 7, okay, I think like 10, 28 this morning to each of the committee members. So there's two There, there was the last one, the opioid. We were at, just getting it updated. As, as you can see, it's still a, a work in progress, so we wanted to have the most accurate. So we did get that last one into you today with the most accurate information, in though, and we appreciate that. Let me know which committee secretary I'm bringing an extra cup of coffee to tomorrow for that. And Chief of Staff, we also did get the two, I thought there was actually the agreement, but we do have the 2023 annual report for contingent fee contract for legal services. Um, we do have that. We actually have it at our desks right now, but it also came by email. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Beth Hickman. I am a Senior Deputy Attorney General in the Tobacco Enforcement Unit of, of the Nevada Attorney General's Office with, with my colleague Stacy Williams, who is also an attorney in the Tobacco Enforcement Unit. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share some information with you about the Master Settlement Agreement. After decades of deception and misinformation, by the, late, by the mid to late 1990s, the harms caused by cigarettes were well known. And many states um, began litigating against the tobacco companies for costs incurred by their Medicaid systems for the diseases that these cigarettes caused. Um, as a result of these civil actions, many states, along with um, Many of the sta 46 states 
and the District of Columbia and five territories signed the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998. There were four major tobacco companies at that time that made up 96% of the cigarette market. Those were Philip Morris, R.J. Reynolds, Laura Lard, and Brown and Williamson. Those four original participating manufacturers um, were, were, the, were the signatories to the settlement at the time it was signed, but since that time, more than 40 other manufacturers have signed on to the Master Settlement Agreement. The Master Settlement Agreement release the participating manufacturers from future and past claims of state incur incurred health care costs attributed to cigarettes. In exchange for this release of liability, the state gets very significant annual payments in perpetuity based on nationwide sales volumes. Um, additionally, there were significant restrictions placed on tobacco advertising of promotional activities. This included things like outdoor billboards, using cartoons to advertise cigarettes, um, sports sponsorships, and as a term of the MSA, the American Legacy Foundation, which is now the Truth Initiative, was formed. And this is a national public health organization dedicated to ending tobacco use in young adults and youth. Next slide, please. The MSA was the largest civil litigation settlement in US history when it was signed in 1998. Um, the 1999 MSA payment to states totaled nearly $4 billion. And from 1999 to 2022, nearly $153 billion have been paid out in MSA funds. Nevada has a 0.6% allocable share of the MSA payment. This was based on the proportion of nationwide cigarettes in Nevada at the time the MSA was signed. Um, in total, dating back to 1999, uh, the state of Nevada has received $975 million. Um, our 2022 MSA payment totaled almost $45 million. Per statute, the MSA payment is divided between the Fund for a Healthy Nevada and the Millennium Scholarship. 60% goes to Fund for a Healthy Nevada, 40% goes to the Millennium Scholarship. When the MSA was signed, the parties acknowledged that because the participating manufacturers would be making such significant monetary payments to the states, they would have to increase the price of their cigarettes. This was consistent with the objectives of the MSA, which was to reduce youth use of cigarettes. They are a price sensitive category of consumers, so raising the price of the cigarettes was consistent with the goals of the MSA. But the parties acknowledged that the manufacturers that were not signatories to the MSA would be able to undercut the market. And there was a fear that they would essentially overtake the market with cheap cigarettes, you know, rendering the objectives useless. Um, to mitigate that risk, the state of Nevada and other settling states impose an escrow obligation on the non-participating manufacturers. This is in NRS Chapter 370A, and the non-participating manufacturers are required to make quarterly payments that are less than but substantial, such that the undercutting of the market wouldn't, wouldn't occur. The MSA payment that our state receives is subject to a number of adjustments annually. There are adjustments like an inflation adjustment, um, some volume adjustments, but the most significant adjustment that is a risk to our payment is called the NPM adjustment. This adjustment occurs if the participating manufacturers have suffered a market loss since the MSA was signed. And in all of those years dating back to 1998, an independent auditor has determined that they have lost a market. The, their market share of the cigarette market has gone down. And the independent auditor has determined that the cause of that decrease in market share was the MSA. That is the triggering mechanism of whether this NPM adjustment could apply. 
if the NPM adjustment applies, only states that did not diligently enforce their escrow statutes against non-participating manufacturers are subject to the adjustment. So this means the collection of the quarterly escrow payments by companies that didn't sign the MSA. Uh, Nevada, as well as 36 other states, have settled the issue of the NPM adjustment through 2022. Um, if a state is found to not diligently enforce their escrow statutes, they can lose up to the entirety of their MSA payment, even though our allocable, uh, allocable share is only 0.6%, because whatever state is found to be not diligent incurs the portions of the NPM adjustment attributable to the states that are diligent. So it sort of just builds on itself up to the entirety of the payment. In addition to the master settlement agreement matters, the Attorney General's Office Tobacco Enforcement Unit enforces the state laws that prohibit the sale of tobacco and vapor products to underage consumers. Um, this portion of our office involves two law enforcement officers and six underage inspectors. And these inspectors work throughout the state to check retail establishments for underage sales. And if our sales rate exceeds 20%, there's a different pot of money separate from the MSA that could be reduced. This is called the Nevada Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant. For federal fiscal year 2023, this is a $18 million grant. And it can be reduced by 10% if the state's retailer viola violation rate exceeds 20%. So, th so uh, my colleague is going to talk to you about AB 53, and the money that that is relevant to is the second pot of money, the substance abuse block grant, rather than the MSA funds. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Assemblyman Haven. I, we're happy to like move, go ahead and move along to the bill and we'll kind of ask any questions that may be um, representative of your presentation and the bill as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, and, and good evening, and we'd like to thank you for your time. For the record, I am Deputy Attorney General Stacy Williams, and I, along with Senior Deputy Attorney General Elizabeth Hickman, we're here to present for you, for your consideration, Assembly Bill 53, which proposes changes to NRS 370.521 with respect to the prohibited sale and distribution of tobacco products to persons under 21 years of age. The purpose of the bill is to create a better balance and enforcement of NRS 37521, um, but with three areas of main focus. The, the paramount focus is to keep tobacco and tobacco-related products from being sold to youths and persons under the age of 21. The second important area of focus is to lower the youth sales violation rate, in particular our SINAR violation rate that um, Senior Deputy Attorney General Elizabeth Hickman shared with you a little while ago. And um, to make that rate well below the 20% threshold so that our great state does not find itself in danger of jeopardizing our federal block grant funding. Um, the final area of focus is to strengthen the accountability of licensees and to encourage them to take stronger measures to ensure the cessation of the sale of tobacco and tobacco related products to underage consumers. So um, AB 53 seeks to modify portions of Section 7A through C of um, NRS 370.521 and to strike the language of Section 7D to add civil penalties and suspension periods for licensees who violate the section. 
As it exists now, NRS 370.521 only imposes civil penalties for first-time violations on the persons actually making the tobacco product sales. So that would be the sales clerks, um, with increasing penalties for every subsequent sale within a 24-month period. Section 7 only issues warnings to the licensees for first and second violations, and civil penalties are not imposed until the third violation within a 24-month period at the same premises. The proposed changes um, will edit Section 7A to impose a civil penalty on the licensee of $500 for the first violation of subsection 1 of NRS 370.521, Section 7B would be modified to impose a civil penalty of $1,000, as well as suspension of the tobacco and or other tobacco product license of the licensee for a period of 30 days for a second violation within that 24-month period and at the same premises. And Section 7C would be modified to impose a civil penalty of $2,500, as well as suspension of the tobacco or other tobacco product license of the licensee for a period of not more than 180 days for the third and subsequent violation within a 24-month period at the same premises. These proposed changes are particularly important because the overall health of Nevada's youth and Nevadans in general is at stake. Statistics show that the instance of high school students in Nevada who report that they smoke or use e-cigarettes is much higher than the national average of all high school students. Despite the fact that we have strict laws already in place in Nevada to prohibit the sale of tobacco and tobacco related products to persons under the age of 21. Despite the passing of Nevada's Tobacco 21 law, Nevada's youth tobacco sales violation rate is consistently higher than 20%. Our SINAR violation rate must get to and remain below 20% in order for the state to avoid being penalized up to 10% of the Nevada Substance Abuse Treatment and Prevention Block Grant, which could mean a loss of 10% more, of, of more than $18 million in federal funding to our state. As of the 2020 SINAR reporting period, Nevada's violation rate was above 25%. The 2022 reporting showed Nevada at a violation rate that remained above 25%. To make matters worse, Nevada was the only state above the 20% threshold for the 2020 annual, annual SINAR reporting period, which put our state on a national platform for noncompliance. In considering the proposed modifications outlined in Assembly Bill 53, we reviewed tobacco-related statutes in several other states with consistently lower SINAR retail violation rates. Our research revealed um, similar and in some cases more stringent practices than the ones that we propose here with respect to penalties issued to violators for uh, retailers for violation of statutes prohibiting the sale of tobacco products to minors. Washington, oh, I'm sorry. Washington State, which was the first one listed, um, issues escalating civil penalties to the licensee on the first and second violations, as well as escalating tobacco license suspensions for the third and fourth violations within a 36-month period. For a fifth violation, the licensee's tobacco license is revoked with no possibility of reinstatement for a period of five years. We also looked at Wyoming. Wyoming has escalating civil penalties that are imposed on both the clerk and the retailer for the first and second violations. For the third and subsequent violations within a 24-month period, the retailer is issued a civil penalty of $750 and up to a 180-day injunction prohibiting the sale of nicotine products. Wyoming does allow a, a waiver of the retailer's fine, but only for that first offense, and only if that retailer can show that it has an established training program for its employees and established disciplinary sanction for employees who fail to comply. We also looked at Arkansas. 
In Arkansas, the clerks and owners can receive fines of up to $100 per violation of the Arkansas Code section. But in addition to that, the state created the Arkansas Tobacco Control Board in July of 2019, and that board may directly assess penalties on the licensee for violations of the same statute of up to $250 for the first violation. For licensees who are subsequently found in violation within a 48-month period of the first violation, the fines escalate and the component of license suspension is introduced. Second violation carries a fine of up to $500 and up to a two-day license suspension. A third violation carries a fine of up to $1,000 and up to a seven-day license suspension. A fourth violation carries a fine of up to $2,000 and up to a 14-day license suspension. And a fifth violation carries a fine of up to $2,000 and revocation of the tobacco license. Just to put it in perspective, Arkansas's SINAR violation rate has been consistently below 8.8%. Delaware also assesses a penalty against the licensee for a first violation, but shortens the window for subsequent violations to within 12 months of the first violation for escalating fines. The component of license suspension occurs on the second violation and is for a period of up to six months. Delaware does also have an established affirmative defense for retailers um, that's embedded in their statute. Uh, but it is specifically for retailers who have adopted and enforced written policies that inform their employees of the prohibition against the sale of tobacco products to individuals under the age of 21. They also have a requirement that those employees sign an acknowledgement of that policy, that they have age verification, and um, that they also must have disciplinary measures in place for noncompliance. So they have the uh, ability to avoid their penalty for failure of one of its employees. However, there is a caveat to that, that the affirmative defense exception can only be used once per location within a 36-month period. And Delaware's SINAR violation rate has consistently been below 9.1%. We looked at one of the stricter um, states, um, New Mexico's SINAR violation rate had consistently been below 11%, but as the state's rate began to trend upwards, New Mexico passed stricter laws with respect to, with respect to retailer violations. Um, as of their passage of their new law, as of January 1st, 2021, New Mexico not only assesses penalties against the licensees for violations at a higher threshold than any of the previous states mentioned, but the introduction of license suspension occurs on the first violation in that state. Under their administrative code, it is the Alcohol Beverage C um, Control Division of the Regulation and Licensing Department that covers tobacco sales to minors, but that first violation carries a $1,000 penalty with a one-day permit suspension. Subsequent violations within a three-year period of that first violation allows the fines to escalate upwards of $10,000 and ultimate permanent revocation of the license. Um, the division may also require their retailers to use identification verification software for a designated period of time as well as a penalty. And then the final state we looked at was Utah. And Utah assesses penalties for the first violation with stricter penalties in place if actual violator is the store owner. And Utah has a graduated scale for subsequent offenses. So if the retailer employee sells, a tobacco, sells tobacco product to a minor, then the retailer is subject to escalating fines for the first and second offenses within a one-year period. For a third offense, within two years of the first, the retailer is subject to a fine of $2,000 or a 30-day permit suspension, and a fourth violation within two years of that first violation carries a $2,000 fine and permit revocation. Utah also makes a special distinction. It, distinguish, it distinguishes its penalty structure based on who is actually making the sale, and if the actual store owner is the person that sells to the minor, then the fines are escalated quicker. So there's a $2,000 fine assessed to the retailer for the first offense. 
if the store owner is found in violation a second time, within a one year of that first violation, the retailer is subject to a $5,000 fine and a permit re revocation. Um, they also have an additional distinction that is called tobacco specialty business um, for retailers where tobacco products constitute more than 35% of the business's gross receipts or that take up 20% of their retail floor space, or if the business is engaged in the sale of any flavored e-cigarettes, that makes them fall into that tobacco specialty business distinction. And for that distinction, if those businesses have violations to, and sell products to um, those that are under the age of 21, the first violation carries a $5,000 fine and 30-day license suspension. And if there is a second violation within two years of the first for a tobacco specialty business, then the fine is $10,000 and the permit will be revoked. So this would be like your vape shops um, that would be covered in that distinction. The commonality among the highlighted states is the issuance of penalties against the retailer for the first offense and sign our violation rates that are consistently well below the 20% threshold. As you're considering um, Assembly Bill 53, you may be wondering how our new tobacco age verification law that went into effect on January 1st of this year is impacting our state's sign our rate, and if that impact alone lessens the necessity to make this statutory modifications that we're proposing now. And, and I just want to give you a bit of history uh, about that. Um, in December of 2019, the president signed into law legislation raising the federal minimum age for the sale of tobacco products from 18 to 21. At that time, our state's sign our rate was well above 22%. As a result of the heightened sensitivity to that new federal law, we did experience a significant decrease in our sign our violation rate. However, within one month of that drastic decline, our violation rate began to trend upward. And within two months, our SINAR violation rate was approaching 18%. Looking at our rates for the latter months of 2021, Nevada's SINAR violation rate remained consistently above 20%, reaching thresholds as high as 32%. Which brings us to our current rate. As the focus of the new law was top of mind for our retailers, we did see a drastic decline in our violation rate for January of this year. Um, prior to that, we were above 20%, and then we saw the numbers trend down to the 7% the mark, which is exactly where we want to be. But as of February 14th, our rate was already back up to 11%. And as of today's date, we're hovering around that rate. So as you can see, we're trending upwards again. If history does repeat itself, uh, as focus on the new age verification law wanes, our violation rate will continue to trend upwards. And as such, Nevada cannot wait until a later legislative session to take action. Therefore, in an effort to lower Nevada's instances of youth tobacco sales, to decrease our sign our violation rate, and to hold retailers accountable in those efforts, we propose that NRS 370.521 be modified to reflect the issuance of civil penalties um, against the retailer, beginning with that first violation, and that the components of, of the tobacco retail license suspension be added beginning with later with the second violation at the same premises within 24 months of the first violation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we do have some questions from some committee members for you. We'll start with Assemblyman Hafen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I, I have to thank you. Um, as many of you know, I've been uh, passionate about this subject. Um, I was the one that carried AB 360 from the last legislative cycle, um, and so I have to thank the Attorney General's Office for working with me um, to bring that forward, uh, because it, it, as you presented today, it's, it's actually been a great success story. I didn't know those numbers until today. Um, so I'm like, I'm really excited. Um, I'm excited to see that we're at 11%, we're within compliance, um, and that we're continuing to hover around there. Um, so I'm just, 
I just have to say that I'm very thankful for all the hard work and effort that's been put into this. Um, even though I know some people would like to just ban smoking altogether, I don't, I don't know if I agree or disagree. Um, but I, you mentioned that if history repeats itself, that we're going to see an increase. Uh, but we're the, the 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 compliance rate that we have to meet is we have to stay below 20, correct? So we can almost double where we're at now and still be within compliance. And we've only seen a uh, looks like about a 4% increase. Um, do you really think that this is um, uh, going to be a problem, or, or do we think that, I know it's only been two months, um, that with the implementation of AB 360 that, that we will be able to stay within compliance? Thank you, Assembly Manhattan. We We're just looking at what happened before. And, you know, our numbers went down significantly within that first couple of months. But as it was no longer top of mind, people just stopped doing what was necessary to make sure that the sales to youth were and, and those under the age of 21 ceased. And so the fear is that as soon as our new um, age verification statute is no longer top of mind, that we'll find ourselves back in the same predicament. If you look at the numbers from um, at right after the 2019 law went, went into effect, we went from very low numbers to 11 to 17 in the next month and then they're on. So I, we're, we're afraid to allow several months to continue to pass and then find ourselves in the same predicament that we are now. Brief follow-up, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you for that. And um, I know the Chief of Staff will um, <clears throat> appreciate me not going on the record sharing the emails and voicemails that I received after the implementation of AB 360. Um, because I, I shared them with her, and I appreciate her assistance in clarifying some of that. Um, because people are upset when they now have to present their ID um, and actually scan it in, um, because they feel they should be able to just buy tobacco at any age. Um, I personally think that it's it's working. Um, that we're doing a good job. That your office is doing a great job now. Um, and so I'm going to respectfully just disagree with you that I, I think that we are going to see because we're now using the, the technology that we have at our fingertips to protect our youth and say, no, 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 we're going to scan your ID. And I'll just give the one little instance that I shared with uh, the former majority leader. So I want to call you majority leader. You're no longer majority leader. Uh, senior citizen was complaining that she's 65, year old, 65 years old and has to scan her ID to purchase alcohol. And I'm like, oh. so I, I, stores are going over and above um, to ensure they've adopted policies that everyone now has to scan IDs. And so I just, I'm not sure that this level of change, though I would agree that, that we might want to do something um, just to continue to have further this conversation, um, I, but I don't think that we're going to have the growth that we saw after the 2019. Thank you. Thanks so much. No, it's like Teresa Benitez Thompson, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford through Chair Bacchus to Assemblyman Haven. I think that we're hearing the point you're saying. The numbers are in a better place that they have been, but it's also um, February and the, the law has been in place for two months. And if we had predictive capabilities to know where we would land after a year's worth of data, we could write legislation tailor made to that. We don't. So you, we will definitely advocate for what we think is going to be the best policy to keep us in compliance and where we need to be. Um, but th I think that's the point of the public policy conversation right now and, and the public policy question before you all. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move to Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. To help me with context, I see that the signer inspections, you had 800 random inspections, and then we saw the data that compared to the other states. Is it standardized how many inspections are done to then get those numbers, or it, we do 800 and, and that's what we've come up with? Does that make sense? Through Madam Chair to Assemblywoman Mosca, it is not standardized. Each state has a sign our sample 
that they are required to inspect and it's based on things like the number of retailers in their own state and their current retailer violation rate. Um, this, the SINAR requirements take into account the retailer violation rate and assume that less inspections need to be conducted in states where the inspection rate is already low. States do perform inspections outside of that SINAR sample sometimes though. Good. Um, next, we'll move to uh, Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, one of the questions in my mind is why why aren't we taking a two pronged approach? Why aren't we going, you know, we're going after the sellers. But why aren't we going after the buyers as well? I mean, what are the current penalties for youth in possession? You know, I mean, they're the ones driving the market. I mean, it's uh, inevitable somebody's going to violate it at some point if they keep you know hitting them. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, Chief of Staff, uh, Teresa Benitez Thompson, through the chairwoman, who I think I'm remembering has given permission for us to bypass. I just want to confirm. OK, thank you. So to Assemblyman Gray. And so um, the Attorney General's office, we are charged with the enforcement of the law. And so we will enforce the public policies that the bodies pass. And um, that's a, a determination for, for you folks to make. Um, it doesn't it doesn't exist right now. I think you might hear from other people in the room about best practices, about um, different different avenues to get to this, but it's 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 just not what the status quo is. Thank you. Um, and definitely, you can always go directly to the member. I, I said that in the beginning, but I'm sure a lot of people forgot. But also make sure you're stating your name um, for the record before answering the question. Next, we'll move to Vice Chair Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm hearing a lot of the same things that my colleague on, on the right is saying when the new law went into effect, especially people over 50 um, and, and that ID. Uh, and I've explained you know, the balance and the reason why we're doing it, but I'm searching for this balance now that we just have a, a new system that will take a few months, six months or so to see what that average is. And if some of these violations aren't going maybe too far when we're just kind of getting that balance, looking at some states where, you know, their second violation is a one day or a one week suspension of sales, as opposed to ours is the third violation within two years is six months of losing um, the right to sell that tobacco. And what worries me um, and the people that I represent is the impact on the jobs and the convenience stores if they lose that tremendous amount of sales that convenience stores have. Um, for, for that. So I don't know if it's this is the final numbers or if you know there's some way to put in a waiver or find a more of a balance for shorter periods in the first few uh, times that the, the sale is caught, the unlawful sale is caught, or something just to expand that time period where we can find what our middle ground would be. Teresa Benitez Thompson, uh, Chief of Staff. I would say if you have specific recommendations, we can talk with you. Um, it, it said at the beginning of the presentation today we, that this is a good example of where we have lots of friends with lots of different ideas of how to approach this. Um, we imagine that we've, we've got uh, some folks who are going to be talking about amendments. We're not taking a, a stance on any of those today because um, quite frankly, we want to see how they might all play together. And, and if you have specific time frames you'd like to suggest, then we'll we'll be we'll be sure to look at them. Um, I think that what staff has wanted to make sure that we impressed upon you was the due diligence and the research aspect for for why we thought that we were presenting what looks to be like best good policy and and definitely um, policy that's reflected in other states and try to mirror states who have really great. Um, um, really great rates that that we would like to get to. <laughs> Next, we'll move to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I I pulled up 370 to try to answer this myself, but but um, license is mentioned 262 times, so I haven't figured it out. Um, so the license holder 
is that do they can they hold for multiple locations or is each location does each location have its own license so that if you have a um, convenience store owner that has multiple convenience stores and you um, and they have the 180 days of suspended license that it impacts all of the convenience stores or just the one where the incidents have been happening. Okay. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Cohen. Um, this is Stacy Williams, Deputy Attorney General Stacy Williams, for the record. The 24-month period is for violations at the same location. There are licensees that have both. They may have um, multiple locations and separate licenses for each of those locations, but there also are a subset of retailers that have one license for multiple locations, and so it would be for it would be location specific. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Assemblywoman Gallant. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was looking at the, your chart where we're seeing pretty low um, violation rates for 2016, 2017, 2018, and then 2019 we implement this law, and then all of a sudden it skyrockets to 13, 30, 20. Have you, other than implementing more regulation, have you had any other explanations as to why we're seeing such an increase in violations um, that could explain this better so we could understand how to attack it better? Teresa Benias Thompson, for the record, you're on. Am I on the right slide that you're referencing seven? Yeah. Okay. Beth Hickman, for the record, to Assemblywoman Gallant. The, we have not identified anything specific that explains that increase. It is um, the vaping epidemic is consistent with the timeline that our slope has gone up, although we did go up more significantly than other states. Um, there, there was not a change in our sampling methodology for SINAR or anything specific that we can point to that explains that jump, though. I may have missed it. Did you state your name for the record? Okay. Yes, I no. missed it. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. Quick question, hopefully. I'm on my, I forget what it is, third violation where you've shut me down for 180 days. What happens to my product? Am I allowed to sell it to another retailer um, because, as I understand, cigarettes do go stale. So uh, you penalize me, and now what do I do with the product, or am I penalized twice with just throwing it in the trash? Uh, thank you so much for the question, Assemblyman O'Neill, Teresa Benias thompson uh, Chief of Staff, for the record. I guess we would hope that your first or second violation was enough of a warning that you value your inventory enough to safeguard it and make the necessary changes as a as a licensee now that we have the ability through the spill to to find you as the license holder that i think our hope is that you don't get to that third one but if you do then then um then then you i i would say probably make a contingency plan if you're asking the legal question can you just sell it to another person no may i follow up I apologize. I'm a little confused. You know, I've hired new employees. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. You've hit me third time. I've got $10,000 worth of cigarettes, which is probably in today's world only about two cartons, I think. <laughs> um, so I'm getting penalized twice when I'm not allowed to dis any other disposal of it. That, that's all I'm just trying to get clarification of. Yeah. So, and uh, Teresa Benias Thompson, for the record, and I appreciate the question. What I will say is that we have no one who's at their third violation right now. In the past 
year, and we can go back further in our data, we have not gotten to a third violation. I realize you're asking a hypothetical question of what if, but it does seem to be that um, we don't get to that third violation with with retailers frequently and nothing in the, the past year, in 24 months. I just think we should have a plan for it because it can happen. You got it in statute, that's all. So I, I appreciate it and we'll talk some more. Thank you, Chair, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, next we'll move to Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I actually will be combining uh, my question with both the, the uh, language presented today as well as the um, um, Senior Deputy Attorney General Hickman's question or information. Um, so I'm gonna start actually with that one first. On the presentation that you gave, um, Ms. Hickman, you, you stated, I think it was around slide six, that when it comes to the enforcement of the state law, that there's two law enforcement officers and six underage inspectors. Is that statewide? Is that um, in specific counties? Is that all that we have at this time? Or is it also working with counties in the attempt to um, catch the bad actors? Because I don't think this is an us versus them situation where you are doing something, but instead that is following the law to make sure that children are not buying cigarettes. Beth Hickman, for the record, to Assemblywoman Anderson. It is statewide to law enforcement officers employed by the Attorney General's Office who are charged with enforcing NRS 375-21. Thank you. So follow up, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. So with that state law, if we were to utilize this money that is possibly being utilized for the fines, um, is there a way then for us to possibly attempt to increase the number of investigators? Because this is a very large state and there are numerous uh, convenience stores, which I could be making a, a guess on my own as to where that would be. Um, because quite frankly, that's a, eight people is pretty small. Um, so is that the intention of possibly utilizing this fee to help us pay for more inspectors or do these inspectors come from other areas of the budget? Beth Hickman, for the record, to Assemblywoman Anderson. Um, our MSA inspectors, or I'm sorry, our, our underage tobacco inspectors are funded through a block grant, are partially funded through a block grant with Health and Human Services because the money is, the money, the signer money is Health and Human Services money. So there's a block grant that partially funds the investigations program, and MSA funds also fund our investigators. And then my final question, if I may, Chair. Thank you. Um, why was the decision made to, um, it's, I, I understand totally about the, the change of violation number um, under the language for page three, um, lines um, 14, through, uh, I'm so sorry, line nine through 14. But why was the decision made to decrease that first fine from $1,250 down to 1,000 instead of keeping it at the $1,250 level? Or quite frankly, I, I do understand where people are coming from, but again, individuals are selling to the youth, which is why I think these fees should be a little bit higher. So what was the decision made as to as to landing on 1,000 instead of keeping it what it currently is in statute. Beth Hickman to Assemblywoman Anderson. There wasn't a decrease because the way it was previously written is there were two warnings and then it wasn't until the third violation that there was 500, so that fourth violation is now <laughs> being reflected down there. Thank you so much. I'm an English teacher, can you not tell? I don't know how to read. So thank you very much for that clarification and thank you, Chair. For the time. Thank you. And I just had one final question um, before we move on to testimony and support. I know you said that there was the risk of losing the $18 million in federal funding. Um, looking at the um, 20, year 2020, where the violations exceeded 20%, did we ever lose funding, or is there kind of like it has to be in so many consistent years? I was just kind of wanting some like further explanation on that, if possible. 
Beth Hagman for the record to Chair Bacchus. There is not a requirement that there be multiple years out of compliance in a row. Each year is viewed for penalty purposes independently. We were out of compliance in 2019. And of course, COVID hit right when a penalty would have been expected to be imposed. And so that, that is actually still unresolved. Um, there was a three-year waiver period after the federal change in age. So there were three years after December 2019 where there was no penalty. So that is the last three years. The sign report that will be filed at the end of this year will be back in potential penalty territory should our rate exceed 20%. Thank you for that clarification. Um, we, we're going to go ahead and move on to um, testimony in support of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Baucus, and thanks to the Attorney General's Office for bringing this bill forward. Um, Bradley Mayer, my partner at Argentum Partners, for the record, uh, on behalf of the Southern Nevada Health District today, and we're testifying in support. You know, tobacco use is really one of the leading causes of chronic disease, and so it's one of the best ways to prevent that is to stop youth from beginning to smoke in the first place. Um, AB 360 from the 2021 session, as Assemblyman Hafen mentioned, um, requires electronic age verification of scanning IDs before purchasing tobacco products. That was an important step, certainly on the path to preventing underage sales when it took effect on January 1st of this year. And we thank Assemblyman Hafen for bringing that forward uh, last time. But as we mentioned, noncompliance of uh, tobacco resale, retailer sales to minors uh, Nevada has and continues to be above 20%, as was mentioned. And at, at last session, we uh, talked about this issue um, in detail. And at that time, the noncompliance rate was close to 30%. And, then, and since that time, in some months, we've seen the rate as high as 41%. So it does have the tendency to jump around at times. And so this final 2023 report that will be made to the federal government, the rate is going to be close to 28%. Um, so I believe, you know, really strengthening the penalty structure on retailers incentivizes them to comply with the electronic age verification uh, law as well, and is a critical piece really into bringing our uh, violation rate below 20% so that the money that we are allocated for this that goes to prevention um, services as well is not put at risk. So we thank you for your time and, and uh, testifying at support. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Backus and, uh, and committee members. For the record, my name is Joelle Gutman here today representing the Washoe County Health District. And we're here in support today uh, for AB 53, and we want to thank the Attorney General's Office for their work on this bill. And I was going to explain SINAR, but you got a pretty good explanation. So I'll just, some of it will be a repeat, but just to reiterate the importance of it. Um, continued non-compliance leaves Nevada in violation of the SINAR Act. It's a federal requirement prohibiting this, the sale of tobacco to individuals under 21. Compliance to SINAR is tied to our portion of the substance abuse block grant um, called the SABG, and roughly that's about $17 million annually. That money right now funds 27 organizations across the state, 10 of those are nonprofit coalitions, and 17 of those are substance abuse treatment um, organizations, so centers and uh, providers. So under SINAR, we have a responsibility to enact and enforce laws that prohibit sales and distribution to minors and develop a samp sampling method methodology to conduct uh, random unannounced compliance checks throughout the state. And then after that, we submit our report. So right now, we are out of federal compliance, and we are on an action plan. Penalties uh, will not be enforced until December of 2023, and right now we don't know what those penalties are, but like the Attorney General's office said, that could be up to 10% of our state's SAB, uh, S SABG block grant. So 
as as Nevadans, we all know all of our behavioral health and treatment facilities are grossly underfunded, and we can't afford to lose those dollars. And we feel like if um, we're following the law, this shouldn't be a problem for retailers. So we think this is the next step from, from last session's efforts to get us back into compliance. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Bacchus and members of the committee. For the record, Carrie Harrington. I'm the director of Nevada Cancer Coalition, and today I'm also speaking as a board member for Nevada Tobacco Control and Smoke-Free Coalition, which consists of partners across the state. We're all working together to improve the health of Nevada, not only by reducing commercial tobacco use, but more importantly, to protect our children from even starting to use cigarettes and vaping products. The Nevada legislature has already made some great progress in working to address youth access to tobacco products, as you've heard, increasing the minimum sales age to 21 years and requiring mandatory ID checking technology. However, more can and must be done to address this issue. As the retail sales level, the source of tobacco products for our youth, increasing the frequency at, of compliance checks and strengthening the penalty structure for tobacco retailers, we know these are proven strategies that work. This bill begins to address these strategies. The Tobacco Coalition appreciates the work of the Attorney General's Office in addressing Nevada's high tobacco retailer violation rate. We support AB 53 at a minimum to address this issue. Also understanding the AG's office faces some challenges in strengthening compliance further at this time. We look forward to continuing to work together with the AG's office in the coming years so that Nevada can actually adopt even stronger policy that meets the best practice standards already in place in other states across the nation. Strengthening Tobacco retailer laws decrease tobacco sales to our youth and will go a long way in helping to curb the youth vaping epidemic that is here in Nevada and across the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else in Carson City who would like to give testimony and support? With that, we'll go ahead and move down to Las Vegas. Do we have anyone there wishing to give testimony and support of AB 53? Next, we'll go ahead to the telephones. Is there anyone on the telephone that would like to give testimony in support of AB 53? To testify in support of AB 53, please press star nine now on your phone to take your place in the queue. Hi there, I'm assuming I got called on because I have been unmuted, is correct? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charlie Moses. My name is spelled M-S-E-S. -E uh, I'm a doctoral student researching the public health impacts of youth substance use. I'm here on behalf of Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. We're a national organization with Nevada members and supporters who prioritize the health and well-being of youth we're in support of Assembly Bill 53. We need to make sure that these addictive products stay out of the hands of kids. It's necessary to have comprehensive enforcement and accountability for tobacco and nicotine vape retailers to decrease youth access to these products. The numbers reflect tobacco and nicotine vape retailers and to youth under the age of 21 years old at 30%, which is a concerning number. And some more concerning numbers, we have that 20.4% Nevada high school students reported it was very easy to get cigarettes, and 34.5 of Nevada high school students reported it was very easy to get vape products. The sole purpose of tobacco and nicotine vape products is to addict people. These products are especially addictive and harmful to youth because of the stage of brain and physical development. Assembly Bill 53 would directly protect the health of Nevada youth and all Nevada residents. Thank you for your time.
Chair, there are no more callers wishing to provide testimony in support. Thank you. Next, we will move to a testimony in opposition to AB 53. If there's anyone in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition, please come on down. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Backus and members of the committee. Mark Hackman, for the record, with I3 Public Affairs. Today, representing Nevada Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association in opposition of AB 53. We have a few concerns with AB 53 as introduced. There are 1,293 convenience stores in Nevada employing 20,817 people, totaling approximately $2 billion in merchandise sales annually across all stores, not counting fuel sales. A single store averages about 1,000 transactions per day. Sales of tobacco products makes up about 33% of convenience store revenue. License suspension that results in losing one third of total revenue will likely put the business in jeopardy of failure. Some of our smaller stores have indicated that a loss of tobacco sales revenue for only 30 days would likely cause them to go out of business. Those stores that do survive would have a significant reduction in staff. There are multiple stores in each member's district and in many cases, a convenience store is the only source of dairy, fresh and frozen foods, as well as other essentials. Adding license suspension to monetary fines creates a strict liability offense in which a license holder is significantly punished for an act they neither performed nor could have prevented. Many of our members have robust training programs that are more rigorous than required, as well as policies that terminate clerks who make illegal sales. It is crucial that legislation is written to be effective in preventing and or punishing the act that causes harm, not the status of being a licensee. This is especially true today because according to the CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey of 2019, 92% of youth access tobacco products from means other than purchases in store. 88% coming from social sourcing, which is the gifting, proxy purchased by another, or transfer from one to another, such as bumming or borrowing. The vast majority of tobacco retailers are doing the right thing by verifying the age of under 40 customers. Our members understand and support laws on the books aimed at preventing underage access to all tobacco products. We want legislation that is effective at preventing access while reducing the negative impact on the community. Again, Mark Hackman with Nevada Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association in opposition of AB 53. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Assembly Committee on Revenue. My name is Brian Wachter. I serve as the Senior Vice President of the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we are at the moment in opposition to a excuse me, Assembly Bill 53. Um, uh, my colleague from the Petroleum Marketers Association, um, I thought, did a great job of talking about the economic impacts. Um, I'd like to address a few things that you heard uh, from the presentation and just highlight them. Uh, we heard testimony that no retailer has ever hit or hasn't in the last 24 months, um, the three violation period. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that if the current uh, schedule, uh, penalty schedule is uh, being an incentive um, to making sure retailers don't get to that third uh, violation. Um, we would question how kind of heavy handed this um, actually is. Um, the other thing that we would caution is comparing um, all of those rates uh, state by state. Um, I know this question came up. Um, those are not always apple to apple comparison. Um, we do believe that uh, moving the tobacco age from 21 to 18 contributed significantly to some confusion. Um, there was a class of citizens that um, had a right to, to purchase uh, tobacco um, and then no longer enjoyed that right. Um, and so there are certainly reasons that we feel um, provide context to those increases. Um, we are also encouraged by the new compliance numbers, um, especially our retailers. While it has been top of mind, uh, we are not at liberty to just ignore um, those scanning uh, requirements. Um, and that is something that we have stressed and our members are stressing. Um, 
we have experienced those same emails that you have gotten. Um, only our clerks don't experience emails behind computer screens. They experience very angry, irate, um, and often folks maybe um, looking for, for a cigarette. Um, they experience those face to face. Um, and so those conversations are happening with those clerks as they are going through it. Uh, we think two violations in a 24 month period is extreme. Uh, we're talking about as a store owner, you have one violation in February of 2021. Um, um, you have a completely different employee, um, say, in November of, of 22. Um, both of those incidences would mean that your license would need to be suspended for 30 days. Um, and we feel that that goes too far. Um, we do agree, and I would borrow the comments from Assemblywoman Anderson, that the uh, fine structure, um, the fine rates may be too low um, and not be providing the uh, proper incentive to be able to, to make sure this activity doesn't continue. Um, but we would stress that we think the new compliance rate is something that is going to continue. Uh, we would certainly wait for um, all of those results to come in um, before we did something as heavy-handed as uh, remove um, a license, which is going to lead to economic problems in the community, both for the license holder um, as well as those employees. Um, it, a lot of these stores are only um, profitable or profitable because of um, this revenue stream, um, and losing that for 180 days is almost going to guarantee that employees are going to lose their jobs. So we appreciate it, and I appreciate the, the patience and the the, uh, the time you've allowed me to have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in Carson City that would like to provide testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 53? With that, we'll go to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas who wishes to give testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 53? Thank you. Next, we'll go to the telephone line, BPS, is there anyone online who wishes to give testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 53? To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 53, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good evening. Cyrus Hojati, C Y R U S H O J J A T Y. If an 18 year old can put his life on the risk by joining the military and buying property, then they should have every ability to get cigarettes. In fact, going back to the presentation, some states still have the same policy as Nevada, but the results are much different. The culture and lifestyle in this state is considerably different. And as I've seen, at the federal level, it's been raised to 21. But yet we see that there's no significant effect, correct me if I'm wrong. For over several decades, we've had the alcohol age at 21. Has this significantly reduced alcoholism? There's no evidence of that because we've seen that the rates even above 21 have come down. All this is going to do is it's going to create a black market encourage people to get more fake identification, and not to mention many of you who advocate of raising the age of not just cigarettes but even firearms to 21 want to give 16-year-olds the right to vote. And why stop at tobacco? We can go after junk food, pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, I've heard articles where they want to push these vaccines to people who are toddlers. And in the last 20 to 50 years, we've seen tobacco use go down. I personally have never smoked tobacco, never vape, hardly ever do any of these addictive things. And I think the best solution is for self-education. As a matter of fact, I've lived here for almost six years in this state, and I've never gambled one penny of my money in this state. That's right. Thank you so much. Yield my time. Thank you. We'll move on to any other callers um, that have testimony in opposition to Assembly Bill 53. Chair, there are no more callers wishing to testify. Thank you so much. Next, we'll move to um, any testimony that is neutral to Assembly Bill 53. Please come forward. We'll go ahead and start in Las Vegas, since we already have someone out there. Just remember to push the mic so we can hear you and state your name for the record. 
Thank you, Chair Bacchus and members of the committee. My name is Leanne McAllister, L-E-A-N-N-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. I am the Executive Director of the Nevada Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I offer this um, neutral informational testimony as context around the issue of enforcing the legal age of buying tobacco. Cigarette smoking is responsible for more than 480,000 deaths per year in the U.S., including nearly 42,000 deaths resulting from secondhand smoke exposure. This is about one in five deaths annually or 1,300 deaths every day. According to 2021 data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, over 13% of high school students currently use a tobacco product. And as we heard from the Attorney General's office and other experts today, Nevada's rate is significantly higher than that. The vast majority of people who become tobacco dependent do so before 21 years of age. Youth brains are susceptible to the addictive properties of nicotine because their brains are still developing. Trying tobacco just one time puts children and adolescents at risk for addiction to nicotine. The majority of smokers, 90%, start by age 18. These young smokers often get their vapes and cigarettes from their friends who are over 18, but under the age of 21. And I invite um, you and the public to learn more about this issue from the American Academy of Pediatrics on the link I've submitted in my written testimony. Thank you very much. If there is anyone else in Las Vegas who wishes to give um, testimony in the neutral, please come forward. Great. We'll go ahead and move to down here. Oh, just kidding. We do have someone. Just remember to push the mic when you um, present your testimony. My name is Megan Bolter, M-E-G-A-N-B-O-E-L-T-E-R. I'm public health law attorney and uh, the Western Regional Director for the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation, also known as Tobacco 21. For more than two decades, the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation has worked to raise the minimum legal sales age for all tobacco and nicotine products to 21 and have developed model policies in conjunction with national health partners to help states navigate best practices when complying and enforcing federal, state, and local tobacco retail license programs. Such policies include that, as Nevada has enacted, including comprehensive tobacco product definitions, tobacco retail license requirements, annual inspection requirements, which Nevada does not include, and clear delineation of penalty structures that have proven effective in decreasing both the sale and the use of these products, given that the true objective of such measures is to reduce and ultimately prevent retail sales of tobacco and nicotine products to kids. We appreciate the opportunity to provide comments and although support revising the penalty structure for retail violations, we remain neutral given that this change alone does not create a means to truly impact sales of tobacco products to youth in the state of Nevada. Although suspension and revocation of a tobacco retail license upon a second cited violation is part of a model penalty structure, even if for a minimum of 10 to 30 days, given some weight to the idea that selling dangerous products to youth is a serious offense in the, state, in the eyes of Nevada, this is assuming a rigorous compliance protocol, which is a systematic review of a retailer's willingness to comply with the law. As you have seen from my colleagues, the SINAR rate is way above what would be allowed for the state to receive its entire allotment of SABT funds. Putting the state at risk of critical funds during an ongoing public health crisis, which includes the vaping epidemic. Even more critical is the loss in health and productivity of a generation of youth that are still being primed for a lifetime of addiction. And just so that you are aware, when we bring up costs and people talk about the cost to retailers, the cost of the compliance program, the campaign for tobacco free kids includes that the cost alone to Nevada due to tobacco use is 1.8 billion annually. So you can be aware that the cost will be received one way or another. I do feel that Nevada is getting hard hit here with respect to the SINAR protocol, and I agree that their improvements need to be made. But comparing them to other states that conduct their SINAR inspections in different ways, New Mexico, the state in which I reside, has yet to complete an entire uh, surveillance about the number of tobacco retailers there have. 
So their surveys are very limited in what they can control or what they can provide in their signer reports. So it's a little bit difficult to compare apples to apples. Nevada has its own revised statutes that need improvement and that could provide a more accurate depiction of what the actual signer rating. That includes annual mandatory compliance checks. At this time, Nevada doesn't include that. Even at one every, 20, every 24 months, you would know then the retailers to go and, and inspect on a secondary basis to see if the, the first citation was effective in getting them to comply with the law. And remember, the law, even with the additional uh, electronics, uh, excuse me, electronic verification, is simply requiring that retailers check the idea. That is the variable that is in question. Check the ID to verify that the purchaser is over the age of 21. It, in, it seems antithetical that the state is struggling with its compliance protocols given this AG's office, office's commitment to hold the tobacco industry accountable for its predatory malicious marketing tactics. And I'm referencing the most recent settlement by the state's AG's office against Juul Labs, which garnered 14.47 million for the state. There are other revisions that would be even more Ms. effective Ms. Bolter, in terms of I'm just going to cut you off here. I think you're kind of going outside of the I'm bill. Um, the is bill. there anyone else left in Las Vegas to give testimony in neutral? No, there isn't, but I appreciate the opportunity to comment, and we do remain re re neutral with recommendations for improvement. It was in within the scope of the bill because this is talking about compliance structures. I appreciate your op the opportunity to comment. Next, we'll move to uh, um, Carson City um, for testimony. Oh, and can you turn, thanks. <laughs> we'll move to Carson City for testimony in opposition. Thank you, Madam Chair Beckus and members of the committee. My name is Nikki Aker. I'm the director of Carson City Health and Human Services. We have made great strides to decrease youth smoking, and we have more work to do. I want to thank the AG's office for their work on this bill. According to the 2021 Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, in Nevada, the percentage of high school students who have ever used electronic vapor products is 36.7%. Additionally, the percentage of high school students who used electronic vapor products during the 30 days before the survey is 17.6%. Also, it has been discovered that 38.5% of Nevada high schoolers said it would be fairly or very easy to get cigarettes if they wanted some, and 47.5% of high schoolers said it would be fairly or very easy to get electronic vapor products if they wanted some. This is almost one in every two minors. The ease and frequency that youth can access tobacco products should be a concern to everyone. To address this youth smoking and vaping epidemic, we recommend providing and promoting strong tobacco cessation programs, adequately fund youth educational and prevention initiatives, and increase staffing levels for compliance checks. Since um, the info that we the info that was provided to my agency indicated that no compliance checks were conducted in Carson City in 2022. And Assemblywoman Anderson um, had asked the question about the staffing. We look forward to work with the AG's office and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we don't have anyone else here in Carson City to offer testimony in neutral, so we'll go ahead to the phone lines. BPS, do we have anyone on the line who wishes to give testimony in opposition to Assembly Bill 53? Testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 53. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in neutral. Thank you so much. Um, do the, pre lose the presenters like to come back up and make any final remarks?
Uh, thank you so much, Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson, for the record, um, Chief of Staff to Attorney General Ford. So, just a couple of things we have heard from a couple of stakeholders that they've you've you've heard from from all friends, all moving in good directions with best interests of different various people that they have different thoughts on how to approach this. So, we'll be having stakeholder meetings to see if there's a better place that we can land at. We do think we're coming from a spot of of great research and due diligence, um, but we know that we've always got to right size things to Nevada for our Nevada way. So we'll be in on those conversations and we will invite anyone from the committee who would like to participate in those just to um, let us know or I guess let the chairwoman know and that from the chairwoman I'd be happy to get a list of names from you and we'll include you in those participation, those conversations. You heard a couple of different things. Um, you heard talk about uh, our our investigators not being as hardy as as we would like, um, and that's always uh, 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 a harder conversation to have. Getting getting more staff um, in place is is always a, a harder conversation to have. Not one that that we're opposed to, just harder conversations to have. Um, at, as well as talking about the number of investigations that we do or can do. There was some talk on the record about people who are 60 or seniors, which I don't know that I would, closer I get to 60, the less I think of that as being a senior age. But um, our investigators are very much youth, and the, the law says to card if they you look um, under the age of 40. So um, we do try to do education out to the retailers as well, so that they they fully understand the law. They don't they don't need um, you know seniors to be carding you know, to our investigators only investigate in legal places and in legal ways, so they will um, show their ID, and, and we try to very much make the distinction that our investigators look to be youth, look they look their age and sh are not confused. We don't send a 39-year-old as an investigator in. We're not trying to do gotcha moves, and that's something that we have lots of conversations with lots of different industries about, but um, for right now, we'll just leave that, and we can follow up with anything else that committee members wanna, wanna discuss. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. We will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 53. Next, I will open the hearing for Assembly Bill 1. And I would ask um, Commissioner Keyes of Esmeralda County to come forward um, along with anyone else that's presenting you with th this evening. Good evening, everybody, uh, Chairman Backus and members of the committee. My name is Ralph Keyes, R-A-L-P-H-K-E-Y-E-S, and I am the chairman of the Esmeralda County Board of Commissioners. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to introduce Assembly Bill 1 requested by our county. Our solid waste facilities include a landfill located in Goldfield and two transfer stations located in Silver Peak, which is approximately 30 miles one way from Goldfield, and Fish Lake Valley, which is a about 75 miles one way from Goldfield. Roll-off containers at the transfer stations are exchanged at least once a week or more often if necessary by using a specialized vehicle for this purpose operated by the sole solid waste employee. The primary source of funding for our solid waste operations comes from a special assessment on parcels. We recently raised the assessments to $56 for vacant parcels $66 for residential parcels, and $150 for commercial or industrial parcels. Some funding is also derived from container, uh, container rental to mining operations or for building projects. In the existing funding scheme, there is no consideration for the volume of solid waste disposed of or any contribution by non-resident persons or companies who use our facilities. The average of Esmeralda County annual taxable sales from 2017 through 2021 was $1,307,660. If the tax proposed in AB1 was in effect, solid waste operations would have received $3,269.15. While this amount would not fund the $106,087 cost of the solid waste operations in 2021, it would add a component to the funding that did recognize volume as more people buy, the more people, the more waste they would generate. It would also parallel inflation, allowing for fewer increases in the parcel fees. 
I am grateful to the committee for considering this bill, and I'm happy to take any questions from the members. And uh, I, I think this will be a quick one. I don't think it'll take as much time as the last couple uh, subjects. So hopefully, I know it's been a long day for me too. So yeah, thank you um, so much for your patience, um, Chair. Um, I. I just wanted to make sure, because I have actually received emails from various people around the state, even if this bill AB1 passes um, this evening, it still has to go to the uh, the, <clears throat> the to county the commissioners mm -hmm. for um, a vote to decide to implement it. And then it ultimately goes to the voters of that county to approve that increase in a tax. Is that correct? <clears throat> That's the way I understand it. There is a safeguard there that the people get to decide this, which is a good way to do it. And just um, for the future, just make sure you state your name for the record if we have any questions from anyone on our committee this evening. We'll go with Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, it, so with the new truck stop that's being built, how is that impacting um, the situation in Goldfield and, and and the situation for the need for the for doing this. Okay, so at this point we have two proposed truck stops. One is uh, north of Tonopah, which is actually in Esmeralda County, and our revenue stream would not change because it's a commercial business and they would pay a one hundred fifty dollars annual fee to for the solid waste uh, assessment on their parcel. Now through this 0.25 sales tax would actually offset considerably um, uh, that um, considerable waste stream that would increase from that business. So the way it's structured, we may get a large increase of, of waste revenue, but not much in the way of uh, funding to, to pay for it. So this would actually help that problem for us. Uh, so that's why it's a, uh, we proposed it here. So. So as it is, parcel owners pay the, the, the fee for the landfill, not somebody buying something at a convenience store. So the people that generate the waste actually help pay for the disposal of the waste. It's it's, it's fairly simple, pragmatic approach that uh, we look, look at this way. So anyway, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Chair and Chair. Okay, next we'll go to Assemblywoman Anderson. And if you can, I'm not sure if your mic is still on, and also state your name. So when you're done, okay. push off the mic. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation, nope. Chair, and especially with how quick it is. So I'm kind of um, working off of what my peer just asked about as well. It's not necessarily clear to me what this um, ordinance would be exactly on. So is that a plan then, or this tax, I guess, is that the plan then to have the county commissioners really specify it before it goes into the voters? Or is it just, I, I'm just confused as to what exactly the, the tax would be levied upon. <clears throat> okay, it would be Commissioner Key, or Ralph Keyes here, uh, to Assemblyman, Assembly Anderson. Uh, it would be basically, 0.25 a quarter percent sales tax, additional sales tax on sales of products in our county uh, with the effect that if you purchase something, more than likely you're going to generate some waste. Uh, if you purchase something at the convenience store, you're going to have something to throw in the trash. So this is to offset that impact to the county because the revenue stream will not keep up the way we generate that uh, revenue to run the solid waste department because it's based on a, a parcel tax or a, you know, a business pays $150 a year for solid waste disposal. We feel that we're going to generate way more than that, and um, that's a way to address that. This, you, buy, you make the trash, you pay for the disposal. It, it's simple terms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the simplicity. Thank you for that clarification. And just, again, it would be to kind of reiterate what the uh, chair said. It would first go to the county commissioners for that language and then go to the voters for a final vote um, timeline that you're thinking about at this time. Well, actually, uh, off keys here again, uh, Assembly, um, Woman Anderson. Um, 
Yes, it would have to be put on a ballot to be voted on. So it has to go through the process. It wouldn't come up for the till the next uh, election cycle. So the Board of County Commissioners would have to approve it to go to the, the voters to, to approve it. So it's a lengthy process, as you know. I do. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, Chair, I completely forgot to ask for that follow-up. So thank you for giving me the time. That's okay. Thank Let's, you. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Anderson. I mean, Armstrong. <laughs> Good evening, sir, and thank you for the uh, presentation. Oftentimes, we, uh, we consider a sales tax regressive. And um, if, if you institute the sales tax, your, your constituents would also have to pay it um, for, uh, on the things that they purchase, right? Um, and so I guess my question to you is, do you believe that the number of visitors who will come and use these two truck stops would far outweigh what your um, residents in your community would end up having to pay for this sales tax? Well, I come in, uh, Ralph Keyes here again to uh, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Um, generally, the way it works right now is everybody that owns property in Osborne County pays a fee or it's, it's a parcel of assessment. That's the only way we generate revenue to run our solid waste department. We don't have a landfill where they have a gatekeeper that collects money going in and out of there. Actually, that would cost us more to run than we have, the system we have right now. So this, this is a simple way to generate a little bit of money to help op offset the cost of, of the actual generators uh, of, of the trash. So without burdening the residents there, they've already paying the bulk of the fee. You come into our, uh, our town, you stop at the convenience store, you buy something, you would be paying a little tiny bit in the sales tax to, to dispose of your waste, not the residents of the community there. That's the, the simplicity of this. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. This, I'm over here. <laughs> Question may be a little early, but have you taken a straw poll of your county residents, how they feel about raising their tax a quarter percent for this effort? Ralph Keyes here. Uh, generally, people don't like increase in taxes, and it is a, it is a bitter pill. Uh, although we did have to uh, raise our solid waste assessments this last year, and that was extremely painful. I mean, we're asking our residents. We have many retired folks. We have a lot of veterans that live there, and they're on fixed incomes. And we've already got an earful from, from them raising our, our fees the way we did last year. So this is another avenue that they would not really be that much of a part of. Uh, you have to look at, we have very few retail outlets in our county. Uh, some of these larger retail outlets that will be coming into business here shortly, I hope. Uh, the people that pass through our county that buy products would and, and throw them in the trash would actually help fund the disposal of their waste. It wouldn't be the taxpayer's burden at that time. The people that generate the waste would pay for the disposal or part of the disposal. So it's, it's, it's really a fair way to do it the way I see it. And I think I could get the, the support from my constituents that way because they've already got beat up raising this assessment last, last year. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions from any of the committee members? Great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. So we'll take testimony now in support of Assembly Bill 1. So if anyone in Carson City wishes to make uh, provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 1, please come on down. It doesn't look like we have anyone here. Just need to check. Is there anyone in Las Vegas who wishes to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 1? Next, let's go to the phone lines. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line who wishes to give testimony in support of Assembly Bill 1? Chair, the public lines are open and working, but we have no callers on the line. 
great. Thank you so much. Um, next, um, we will take any testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 1 here in Carson City. Is there anyone who wishes to give testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 1? Okay, next we will move to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas who wishes to give testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 1? Okay, BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line who wishes to give testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 1? Chair, we still have no callers to give testimony. Great, thank you. Um, next, we will move to neutral testimony. Do we have anyone here in Carson City who wishes to give testimony in the neutral to Assembly Bill 1? Good evening again for the second time, Madam Chair. Brian Walker with the, uh, with the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we typically take a, a neutral position on questions, especially uh, when they are going to um, the public uh, for an election cycle. It's up to them. Uh, we did, however, want to get on the record that uh, we would really look um, and ask the counties to make sure um, that the rate is um, effective um, and that it's going to generate the, the revenue that they're looking at. Um, this committee is probably going to hear over the next 100 days or so about tax erosion, especially in our sales tax. Uh, sales tax applies uh, or, or supplies um, just shy of 50% of all state revenue, uh, local revenue, and county revenue. And because of digital sales tax and the fact that more and more of our products are being purchased in digital format and not in tangible format, we are going to continue to lose sales tax um, over the course of the next uh, 20, 10, two years. Um, and so we would just put that on your radar um, to look at the, that tax erosion policy as you're contemplating all these sales tax uh, enhancements. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any further testimony here in Carson City in the neutral to Assembly Bill 1? With that, we'll move to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas wishing to give testimony in the neutral to Assembly Bill 1? Next, we will move back to the telephone lines. VPS, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to give testimony in the neutral to Assembly Bill 1? Chair, we still have no callers to provide testimony. Thank you so much. And with that, Commissioner Keyes, if you wish to give concluding remarks, that would be your time right now. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Chair Backus and members of the committee. Um, like I said, it's never fun to impose a tax, and I think uh, we would do well with it if we do, if the voters do approve it, I think it would be a good thing because uh, we are the poorest county in the state. We're always struggling like most other counties, and uh, this is one way to offset uh, burden on our citizens. So thank you for considering that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for your presentation this evening, um, Commissioner Keyes. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 1. And that brings us to the last item on our agenda, public comment. Is there anyone here in Carson City this evening who wishes to give public comment? Next, we will go to Las Vegas. Is there anyone in Las Vegas who wishes to give public comment? BPS, I don't know if anyone's rejoined the phone line, but is anyone on the phone line that wishes to give public comment this evening? Chair, the public lines are open and working and we still have no callers. Great, with that, um, are there any remarks from anyone on the committee? I don't think so, okay. We will have our next um, committee meeting on Thursday evening in room 4100. So I look forward to seeing you guys that evening at 4 p.m. We will be hearing AB 38 and AB 41 that evening. Have a great evening.